Two artists who've got studios in the Phoenix building talk about their practice. Um, and it's, you know, it's a relaxed evening, informal really, you know, just sometimes there are insights between people's practice. Today we have Claire Nyas and Hugh Fox. Claire has been in, working in this building since the dawn of time. <laughs> That's what she said to me. But actually, no, been working is a stalwart of Brighton's sort of artist groups, as a member of May's art group. Uh, Red Herring, these were back in, well, it must be 25, 30 years ago, back in North Road. And yeah. they were in this building like for a long time. time. Yeah. And been back and forth out of this building, whereas Hugh is new to the building, only been here for seven months. Yeah. So, um, that's about it really. You know where the bar is. The talk's generally 30 to 40 minutes. Questions at the end is usually good. And uh, there's a break after the talks. Go and get a drink, whatever you like. And then, Claire's going first, who's going second. And uh, I hope it's all good fun. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for turning up this evening um, to hear this talk. Um, I was just going to uh, tell you about the work I'm doing at the moment and then um, go back to, to so you can see what's led up to it. Um, the work waste. Um, so uh, at the moment I'm working on this um, Constantina book. And um, as you can see from the, on the shelf, but it's actually a lot bigger than it looks up there, which is. Okay. So it goes on for quite some time. And, um, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So indeed, it needs a very long shelf. Wow. We could put it on the table. Sorry? Is that okay? We've got the light on. Is it? Oh, yes. Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you're going in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the middle. <laughs> so it's on going in one way or another. And um, so I just got this book from um, C. Whites years ago. Um, this one for about six quid. And I thought to myself, one day I'm going to do something with that. And this was, you know, possibly a decade ago. And I kept leaving it and leaving it. And one day I just thought, right, now. <laughs> so um, I started <coughs> a few drawings sort of here and there and everything. And I thought, well, I've got to choose a media that's going to work and not smudge against each other. So finally came up with um, pen and ink or brush and ink. And um, so it hasn't much so far. And um, yeah, so it's not a narrative. It doesn't just start there and end here. Well, it kind of does. But um, what I've done is I started at one page and then maybe another there and then try to link um, images, which has been nice for me to, to kind of, it's like a puzzle. The whole thing's really like a puzzle. So. I plan it to a certain extent and then leave it to see what happens. Um, and that's actually, I could say that for a lot of my work, is I start a drawing and then kind of just see what happens. Um, I keep lots and lots of sketches, um, always have done. But uh, particularly now, and I just fill them with things like, things I'm interested in. Um, Things I like and think, oh, I'll draw that. Some things that I find and stick into it, that kind of thing. And um, so I come back to them to and fro. Is that like turn the ball off? Yeah. Turn the ball off. Yeah. It's in preview, and every now and then it kind of. Uh, as I should preview. So, uh, <clears throat> so these are some. I'm just going to flip them quite quickly. So you've seen this kind of thing. 
So these are scans, obviously, and um, they don't link to each other particularly, so it's not so effective. Okay, so um, coming to this drawing. So one of the times that I left um, Phoenix was because I came to a real full stop in my work. I just didn't know where to go with it. And um, I was doing more and more writing in the sketchbook, so I thought, I'm going to take time out to do some writing. Sorry. And I didn't want to um, not do something. So I thought, oh, this is a good time because I'm quite stuck. So before I actually left, <laughs> I thought, I'll just do some drawings for the sake of doing some drawings. And I, I said to myself, I'll draw an hour for an hour. And um, so I set myself an hour and just came out with these things. So, um, and then I didn't go any further <coughs> with them. But that's what I was left with. Um, but I can see now that there are things coming up that are, that these kicked off without me realising it. Okay, so I did some writing and then I put some illustrations with the writing. Um, um, so these are a couple of them. I don't know if you can see these, some of them are really pale. Uh, so I'm going to flip through them quite quickly. And so it's things like, uh, these are the flight paths of insects. And, uh, and this is a train journey, so I would, on, when I was on the train, just hold my pen on the paper and go with the movement on the paper and then work into that expanded as a drawing. So very pale. This is a, no, you can't, probably can't see it. It's a kind of narrative of, um, I not say, but this is what it is. I've always liked drawing um, paper. So um, these are a series of drawings that got me back into what I'm doing now. Um, so, I, but I did do these quite a few years ago, but they do kind of connect. So, so I suppose they show actually the one before you can see clearer. So I kind of think I just wanted to go with what I like, things I like. So I wasn't going to get any more um, complicated than that, because one of the things that had finished me before why I came to the closed door was constantly having to say something about what my work was about and it just killed everything to have to say and then when I was drawing and stuff I was thinking oh what's this about and kind of um, imposing a, a narrative on them um, and um, just killed it for me so now these days I just say do kind of things that I like and, um, and then I see what I like, seems to be things that work and mechanics and stuff that's around me all the time. I like scientific uh, botanical drawings, I like um, uh, wiring, <laughs> and um, I like uh, Torn paper, I like scientific drawings of stuff that I don't under, understand particularly. But um, I kind of know what I like, if you see what I mean. Okay, then I came on to uh, this series of drawings. So that was um, uh, 2016, I think. So I decided, I thought, well, I'll get into some colour and then really spend time um, developing the uh, pieces I was doing before, working um, from the pencil drawings um, and then push them further. So I got really stuck into doing these, which is sort of a lot of overlaying. But as I say, I started off with something and then pushed it further without particularly knowing um, where I was with going with it. And it was kind of, um, <laughs> made me really happy. It was kind of a liberation, and um, not to have to explain it, and still going on what I call these roughly um, how things work. 
and I don't want to get more complicated than that. I suppose people looking at them can, um, can make up their own mind about what they might mean or uh, things they might see in it. Claire, how big is that one? Um, it's about this big, so A3. Kind of. What materials have you used for that? Um, I've used um, here coloured pencil, okay. kind of separating, trying to separate myself what coloured pencil means from the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I could say they're watercolour because I did use paint, but basically they are coloured pencil. No, and um, if I'd had my time again with this, I would have done it on paper that kind of works with um, coloured pencil. This was a piece of paper I happened to come across. Actually, I think I tore it out of a sketchbook. Um, so, yeah. So they're really detailed, and I work for hours on them, but that seems to... I don't ask any questions, I just <laughs> go along with, with what seems to suit it, whatever. So I'm kind of quite interested in wiring, as I said, and also interested in things where wiring goes wrong or, or gets uh, complicated and can't work. Well, I also like maps, so that comes into it, which Maps, I suppose, are they're trying to technically um, work out how land works or one piece of uh, land next to another. I mean, it's all kind of um, keys and ciphers and things like that. And um, what else do I like that's in there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, that kind of thing. I think my starting point was um, some reels of wire I saw somewhere. Oh, and then this shape here, and I thought, which is supposed to be roughly the shape of a, a mobile phone. But I kind of like the fact that they're, um, well, obviously the mechanics inside are tiny and, and very detailed, but I kind of like the idea of them actually being quite complicated and doing the same things as messages going through wires. Um, yeah. And um, that one that started off as um, being like headphones as far as um, information passing from one place to another. And then for some reason it became the uh, River of Seine going through Paris, so <laughs> stuff happens in between. And that was the um, bit on my Mac that charges it. <laughs> it's got a charger, I think. And um, so a lot of stuff feeds into it, um, as I say, from my sketchbooks, which are things that have interested me. Um, which generally do. Um, and so those are some details. Paper, I like paper and string. Um, where's that little bar again? And there's a book again. And I suppose that's what's kind of led up to that's a general thing that has led up to what I'm doing now. Um, might leave the rest of it as a if you want to ask me any questions, um, feel free. <coughs> um, I could say that I suppose I started off in um, illustration and then I moved on to um, fine art printmaking, if that's a bit more of I mean, it's interesting to see them so large. I mean, I haven't seen them small, I've been out. I've not really seen this work. So two questions. One is, do you show them ever? And secondly, what is it like seeing them so large? Because they can really take it. You know, there's so much there. It would be wonderful if they were... Well, perhaps it would be wonderful if they were. Yeah, because there's so much. But maybe they're even better when you see them. Yeah. No, 
Because when there's so much, isn't there? You want to see it. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, I had thought about doing um, bigger paintings and I was sort of wondering how they would be um, projected larger than they are, because often you see large work uh, minimalised, yeah, and that looks absolutely great. Um, and I thought this would show up all the glitches. Um, so it's interesting to see. Um, am I going to show them? Yes. Um, I will, I'd like to, I haven't planned a specific thing, but yes, I'd like to have a show sometime. Window gallery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think your sense of colour is beautiful. Um, and I love the way that, that this has this sort of mutability going on in the process of making the drawing. I, I find that really exciting. And I, I like all the different shapes you bring into it in this kind of the wiring and the mapping, um, I, I kind of think they, they have so many layers to them. You know, not just their literal meaning, but, you know, other meanings that might um, emerge from that. Um, I just wonder, you know, it, it, uh, wait, do you work in them individually or are you working with them as a series? Well, I've worked on the, the four that I was showing you earlier as a series. I right. just wanted them to work so at together. different times you might go from one drawing to another? Or yeah, 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 so I pick them up, get them to a certain stage, so I have plenty of time to have a look at what I've done. You know how it's often a, a good thing not to look <coughs> at it for a while. And um, so that's... <coughs> That's why, and the, the smaller ones are puzzles. I mean, they're all puzzles for me. And I have had people look at them and think they're abstract, but they're not, they're not abstract. I mean, in the way you could call them still lives, or you could call them landscapes, or anything like that. So I never know, when people say, what do you do? Um, I'm quite stuck to actually have a handy answer. <laughs> I hate that question. Yeah. Um, are they titled? Um, I kind of really find um, putting titles onto things really difficult because I think they can just reduce how you see something if mm -hmm. I'm telling you it's supposed to be this. So I'll put temporary t titles on them. I mean, this is one thing after another, but um, I don't know, that suggests a narrative which I don't see as a narrative. So. That's quite um, a good title, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it might stick, <laughs> that's what And then the other ones are how things were. And then the ones before that you could hardly see. Um, I just look at the shape of them and they're kind of vaguely brain-like. So at the moment they're brains, but <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Going back to this scale of these um, talk. I quite like it when small tiny drawings are enlarged, high resolution enlarged, and you get all the pencil marks and things. It'd be quite interesting to see some of those drawings um, yeah. printed up large. Yeah, yeah as, as I say, it's sort of quite interesting yeah. to see them today yeah. larger than life, because yeah. I was um, wondering about the the glitches that might show up. But yeah, yeah, I could. I mean, really, what I'd like to do with this one, I know it's what you were talking about, but to um, carry on with this over the back as well. Um, because I'm really enjoying doing a one long line drawing. I just sort of think, well, why would I stop? <laughs> so I was thinking I could go around the back, but attach it to yeah, another um, book, just to carry on and on. There's a problem displaying it because you know you have to have a certain length. Oh, really? You could display sections of it. You could you could have an enormously long book, and when you display it, it could be kind of open to different points, couldn't it? And some of it concertinaed up. Yeah. So it would be very different, or it, it could change throughout the exhibition because you moved it along a bit. Well, so, yeah. for the open studios, I had these. Um, three shelves that went like that because my walls are only a certain size so I kind of had it mm -hmm. moving along um, and um, it was 
when you were looking, and well, I was enjoying people looking at it because they had to move along to um, to see it, and that was sort of part of it, really, that they had to move to. Um, well, and also they become quite sculptural because I remember that in your studio, in the open studio, and I like that. And I mean, um, someone like Cornelia Parker, who's used drawing in a very sculptural way. Um, you know, it, it has that resonance of being able to look at the sort of illusion of what you've got in the drawing, but how it occupies the space as well. Yeah. Which I found really interesting. I was, sort of, I was thinking about if I did both sides, yeah. well, how would that, um, which I really would like to do, how would that work, yeah. you know, displaying it? Yeah, the long... Long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what it would have to be. <laughs> which, um, well, I'd like to try that but yeah well then the, the the drawing itself is a drawing within the space yeah the physical yes the presence I, of it yes absolutely yeah i yeah. really yeah, well, that, that, i think it's really interesting because it's has such a dynamic to it yeah and i would have never guessed when i picked up the constantina book and decided saying to myself i would like to do something is i would never have guessed all that would yeah. have come out of it if you seem, seem committed to going on the other side, then it would be quite easy to just get another book and <laughs> do it in a different book. It's a bit more like going back to vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> As we were talking about earlier. <coughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying sort of playing with it to see what happens. Mm. So, Good. keeping me um, interested in it. Sorry. sorry. Oh, we've gone. Oh, no, it's your technology. Don't you love it? You love it. Yeah. Um, I noticed you got what looks like, I mean, it almost looks like a bit of text, but which is quite. Um, oh, the writing. Yeah. Have you thought about text within these pieces? Yeah, I'd really like to work with yeah. more text. Um, that, that, it is um, something that my father wrote, and when he wrote, he was just like this and pressed the pencil in and right into the paper. And he also um, uh, was quite like that in his life. <laughs> really liked everything organised. And when he died, I was looking through some of his things. And I saw that he'd written something with all the figures. And then he'd put something like reorgan. And then he ran out of space. Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yes. <laughs> but, um, so I put that back to front, but I just quite like that idea. Yeah. It, um, it wasn't always totally. I, I like the, the thing that you said about them being puzzles. And they leave me with a sense of uncertainty. And I think a lot of good art has got an ingredient of uncertainty in it. Um, is, is that an intention of yours to have uncertainty? or? Yeah, I'm really happy else? with that. Yeah. yeah. I think once I, I think that was a problem before was everything had to be kind of explained and uh, something. Well, mm. that's how I took it. It didn't have to be really, but I kind of got um, stuck on that. But yeah, that's I'm really enjoying that um, freedom of not having to tie things down. So I, it's um, I'm really enjoying not knowing what's going to happen next and not I having guess that gives to. it an organic flavour as well, they seem to grow. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say, it has a really, you will get like an organic circuit board or something, it's got a real, mm -hmm. it's a real so. Yeah, I think that's, I suppose that is how, when I'm interested in things and say in my sketchbooks, I sort of just collect things because I like them and that's nothing, so it's interesting to hear, you know, what people See, I always like, you know, in the open studios when it was up, just really good. You know, people might come in and say, what's it about? And um, I'd go, what do you think it's about? And then they kind of tell me, and that was great. I really, really like that. Isn't, isn't it about the fact that you've done so much work in the, in the past, when you, you're, not, you're never starting completely from nothing. No, that's so right. You are, yeah. you know, you, you're self kind of programmed. Yeah. To, to, to do things, and there may be motifs that you keep using and yeah. then wiring things and then wiring things into bridges and then mm. Mm. whatever. You, 
you know, it's a bit like the next bit. You know, the previous bit is a sketch for the next bit. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe one that's three on from it. Yeah. And then I suppose it's like making some way you go. I'm not going to do a bit more work on. Yeah. Because if you're making an album, it would be, I'm going to go, oh, I'm working on this song, but yeah. I've got an idea for that song. I'm just going to go back and do something on that song. Yeah. And, uh, I think um, that having to get ready for this at all has just been brilliant, even if. Um, I hadn't actually ended up done, done doing the actual tour. It just made me go through old work right back and right back. And I just thought, oh yeah, I see where that came from. And whereas at the time I felt like, I don't know what's happening, and I'll put that aside. And then um, now I can see what, and I sort of trust myself a bit more. This is based on something. I think that's, that's a real key thing you said actually about trust. Because, you know, I think we've all gone through those moments of crisis where we think, oh, well, this should be this, or that should do that. And, and then actually, what you kind of, you have your sort of meltdown, and then out of that comes a sense, well, you know, it doesn't actually matter what I do. And then suddenly you're in the, the land of unknown, and that's where <coughs> those exciting things happen, because yeah. you're opening up questions. It, it, you know, it's organic. It, it can go anywhere, and yeah. you're letting it do its thing in a way. But you're right, Andy, those other things that have come before inform that process. Mm. And I, yeah. I think that's it's a very sort of important part of what creativity is. Mm. And yeah. because, you know, we're all drummed in, everything has to have a purpose. Well, actually, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. And also, you were rather modest in saying, oh, I just do uh, just things that I like. But the things you like is. is done a lot to arrive at that point. Yeah, yes. I think that's the thing, yes. it is, you know. um, but it is, or well, what I like is what I've always liked, but I haven't kind of asked myself why do I like this thing. So, um, you've just been more intuitive, sorry. You're slightly apologetic about the coloured, beautiful, amazing, wiring, plugging in things before, and um, just, and it's a bit of a dirty word, but commercially, yeah. we used to have an art gallery, and we used to be advertising, they're bloody amazing. I mean, honestly, if you wanted to sell some stuff, those are big. I should think they would go down very well. The colour palette was extraordinary, and it was interesting, and you could look at it for hours and see something different every time, and you whizzed through them. But I wish you had that up on the screen now, because I'd still be looking at it. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to say that, because, you know, it just, I know it's a slightly dirty word, but if you, um, wow, they were really, you know, when we had a gallery, and people were bringing in all their stuff every single day, I met you because we knew he was amazing immediately. Um, but, <laughs> but that, that, oh, wow, yeah, wow, I could sell those. You could print those up and canvas and they sell. They're really, really interesting. So, so I just thought I'd say that. Thank you. I love the uh, concertina look as well. I think that's brilliant. It reminds me of you know, how the mm. toolbox is, the concertina. Oh, yeah. It's sort of like, mm. and you've got all your different wiring. In a way, they're, they're clever, aren't they, those books, just that mm. toolbox. Mm. And I really, I'm really, i constantly looking at things and thinking, oh, that's <coughs> clever. How does that <coughs> work? Well, actually, I don't want to know. I just look at it and think, that's clever. And that's I'm saying that all the time, that lots of technology. <coughs> and, you know, you have to go around a, something like a um, ironmonger's. I love <laughs> those. <laughs> <laughs> I just love them. Yeah. Especially when you go to... Uh, different countries, and you see how people have done that thing that does that particular thing. I just think that's amazing. Claire, I'm uh, interested. When you stop working, how long did you stop working for? Because I mean, what interests me is that, well, basically, like Andy said, this work is demonstrably you, and very much like the work you were doing, or reminiscent to me, the work yeah. you were doing before this. I stopped for about, stopped completely drawing for probably about um, five years really? or maybe a bit more and then it just sort of kept creeping back and uh, writing is really difficult. If you give me a, a blank page and say write on it and um, then give me another page and say draw on it. I would so not go for the writing page because it's so difficult writing. 
So, um, yeah, I couldn't resist. And it was nice when, um, for me anyway, when I started drawing again. It was such a relief to come back home, kind of thing. So did you actually sort of deliberately resist drawing? You put some kind of pressure on yourself, as you? About um, drawing. Is that what, I suppose, um, that in that way you're saying you needed a, you felt that you needed a reason to do it? Um, in fact, the reason is that you just need to do it. Yes, I think that's what I found. Because with the writing, there was this sort of thing like, oh, I've got to, I should get the drawings to go with the writing or illustrate it or something like that. And then, um, then I let myself off the hook with that. And they weren't working anyway. And I still have the problem. I've got the bit of writing and I've got the drawings. And I still can't work out how they work together. But I can't let that one go because the thing that between the, the overlay point between the um, writing and the drawing is me. So there must be some kind of way you, of You've kind of answered your question when you were talking about the text of your father's. The text is visual there. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's kind of, it, it's not a separate thing. It's, it's embedded in the whole rationale of your mm. process there. Yes, as a sort of, yes. <laughs> and I think as I uh, go on, I'll sort of um, look into that more, actually. I just like found writing and the shapes of it, but with um, that piece of writing that of my father's, thanks. Um, that was pretty good finding that, and um, you know, maybe do some more of that kind of thing. Um, have I done my time? <laughs> 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 no, 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 Well, if no one's got any questions, I thought that was... That was great. Lovely. Oh, Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, time for Hugh to talk about his work. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm a photographer, and uh, my work probably sits somewhere between uh, portrait, street photography, and documentary. Uh, and I try to work well. Most of my work, I work in very sort of loose, intuitive way, especially when it comes to sort of street photography and documentary photography, um, I just like to um, yeah, look for narrative or a bit of humour in, um, in what I'm photographing, uh, as this image here, which looks very overexposed for some reason. Um, yeah, uh, for me, the um, carousel, when it's all being wrapped up, sort of represents the end of summer and uh, I always seem to be drawn towards it and photographing it when it's wrapped up at this time. They're in the middle of wrapping it up and a big gust of wind blew and it, it sort of made me laugh that it felt like the carousel was sort of trying to eat this last, grab this last person for <laughs> one final ride. Um, um, yeah, so again, another image where I'm just looking for, I'll often find a space and wait for something to happen in that space that um, makes the image interesting. As with this, which some of you might recognise, which was shot out of my studio window. Um, when I first moved in, I'd been looking out every day at this one particular mm. space and it's waiting for something interesting to happen <laughs> in that space. So it's probably a couple of days and I've taken quite a few pictures because there are quite a few interesting uh, characters you get out the back there. Uh, and yeah, these uh, mother and daughter walk past and they happen to be wearing yellow and yellow and uh, the double yellow lines and I just thought, oh great, you know, let's see. Um, and again, images like this, uh, I've 
scene in a uh, composition and I wait for an interesting character <laughs> to walk into frame. Um, and then I also work in a slightly less, I guess, intuitive way. I don't really stage my portraits, but um, I will go to a place that whoever I'm photographing likes to go to and I will sort of let them um, sort of find the space that they like to be in and then uh, go from there. So, yeah, this obviously isn't one of my photographs. This is um, Hopper, who I'm very inspired by. Uh, I obviously love his use of uh, colour and light. And, um, yeah, he, and the way he depicts sort of lone figures and these sort of huge, fantastical sort of scenes and how they're usually sort of looking inwards, introspective. It's, it's to me, quite interesting because a lot of my work deals with spaces and how people interact within those spaces. Um, and another um, person I'm very inspired by is Martin Parr, who uh, obviously brings a lot of humour into his images. And um, also, I think makes quite sort of interesting and quite serious social. Uh, what word I'm looking for? Um, commentary. Sorry. Yeah, commentary on uh, <coughs> on uh, British life. So uh, yes, this is heterotopia is a word that I came across when I was doing uh, my MA at Brighton and my work had I'd been looking a lot at um, spaces and transitional spaces and spaces of otherness and when I came across uh, the work by uh, Michel Foucault who's a French philosopher and uh, the word heterotopia, which I'm going to read out what it means, uh, <laughs> is um, basically spaces that have more layers of meaning or relationship to other places than immediately meets the eye. Um, so for me, these spaces are um, both uh, physical and metaphysical and internal and external and real world and virtual world spaces. Um, so for example, that of a mirror or a screens, television sets. Um, as these spaces are both uh, yeah, physical and metaphysical at the same time. And of course, uh, <laughs> Uh, phones are very interesting because obviously we're all addicted to them and um, it's quite <laughs> amazing <laughs> the spaces that we uh, use them in. Uh, another space that I'm really interested in is uh, galleries. Mm. Um, I find it for me, the space between the artwork and the viewer is where the magic happens, which is why I don't really, a bit like Claire, give any of my images names, because I like to leave it up to the viewers to interpret what's going on and to, and to read into them what they might. For me, um, I find this image interesting because You've got the old guy on the left uh, sort of looking into the dark abyss and this young guy on the right um, reading about this portrait and being inquisitive and then that's reflected with the young guy in the painting looking out and 
the old guy is also um, feels to me like it's slightly <laughs> reflected by the uh, statue of the older guy, sort of looking pretty dead eyed and nonchalant in the right corner. Um, so I also like to uh, shoot in airports and car parks, shopping centres. I find it really interesting how we try to sort of protect our personal space when we're in public spaces um, because often we can feel uh, quite vulnerable when we're in those spaces. Um, so this is slightly different. I want to talk about um, a uh, portrait project that I've been working on um, with uh, Madame Alice de Bourgeois, um, who lives above my uh, wife's parents in Paris. Um, she's 98 and she lives on her own. And I decided to um, do a series of portraits with her in her home. So I was fascinated about, well, the fact that she was 98 and still lived alone and the fact that she was part of the French resistance in the Second World War and she's still very politically active and engaged. And I was wondering why, what may uh, help her carry on in this way and um, the more time I spent with her the more I sort of realised that she had sort of cocooned herself in this amazing house that was filled with past memories and also there seemed to be a running theme throughout the, her home of reds <laughs> which um, is obviously associated with strength and power and love and passion and I started thinking that maybe this has actually helped her sort of carry on in the way she has. She's an amazing woman. I'm also uh, made a short documentary about her, which I'm in the process of editing, which at some point will sit alongside the series of portraits. Uh, yes, there's lots of red in different <laughs> places. Um, and even when she would leave her apartment and go outside, there was always a bit of red that she would she would take with her. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a collaboration that I've been doing recently um, with a artist artist Darvish Fakur. Um, he's an American Iranian artist. Um, who has recently got into um, performance arts and basically dance in the street. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, we've been doing this series of images called A Likeness of Being, um, which I guess the, the um, explanations in the title that um, okay. and this is, we also have been doing moving image as well as um, stills and um, so we'll often go into a public space I mean, this is a quiet sort of back street, but sometimes it will be in a train station or shopping centre or wherever. He basically feels like he wants to dance. Um, and the idea really is to give people an, an alternative <laughs> to how they feel they should be in public spaces and how we move through public spaces and to show them that we we can just stop and dance if we
just meet up and we don't really know what's going to happen or where we're going to go and we'll just either shoot some stills or make a short video and um, it slowly is becoming, I guess we've been doing it for a couple of years now so it feels like it's slowly, we're starting to get a bit of a series together, um, especially with the likeness of being one, these are some more. <laughs> so is he jumping or Yeah, he's jumping and yeah, he's very good at sort of keeping his legs very <laughs> very and his feet very flat. Um, and obviously it's very fast shot speed as well to sort of capture the Uh, so this is another collaboration I did with another performance artist, Rachel Blackman, um, and I did a course with her a couple of years ago, um, which was all about um, her body language and how we sort of communicate to other people through um, through our body language and how we can stand up straighter to give ourselves more confidence or um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit brain in that. Um, but this series that we did um, which was basically looking at um, body language and posture and how much we read into body language especially when facial expressions are removed um, which is why we Mask or not. Um, so just the sort of subtle shifts in posture um, say so much about how that person's feeling or how confident or shy they are or how um, Uh, and then finally, I was just going to show you guys a bit of uh, the street photography um, that I do, uh, which a lot of it I tend to shoot with whatever camera I have to hand, which usually is just an iPhone. And if I find something interesting, I'll go back and shoot it on a, on a better camera. But um, generally, if it's a moment that I'm going to miss, I'd rather capture it on the phone, even if it's only going to be so big, then, uh, yeah, not have it at all. So I'll just run through some of these. Yeah, again, I'm always looking for sort of little hidden narratives like I didn't 
actually realised when I took this guy's picture, I just saw him and thought, wow, he's, he's got a pretty amazing look. And then afterwards, when I was looking through the pictures, I noticed that smoothies have been <laughs> um, reflected on his, <coughs> on his shirt. Um, this, so during the summer, I spent a lot of time um, at various seaside uh, beaches up and down the south coast. Um, and I just kept going back and back. I was just really drawn to how we act in these spaces and how we are. Um, so I think we act very differently because there's a whole different code to how we have to be, I suppose, when, when in these spaces. Um, Image I was wanted to show because um, I took hundreds and hundreds of images of the sea bashing up against the sea defence down by the marina, and there were loads that looked pretty amazing. But um, I was quite shocked when I sort of looked closely at this to see the sort of face, sort of Neptune figure, <laughs> just sitting there, um, which is something I always try to find. Um, yeah, and again, just more street photography that I tried to find sort of a hidden narrative and a visual poetry that space that I find very interesting is uh, people's bedrooms because obviously it's such an intimate space that you wouldn't usually allow many people to go into or bring many people into um, so I find bedrooms very interesting to photograph and homes in general. Spaces or thinks about it within their work, within the sort of hedge topic idea of spaces of otherness and in between spaces. people are occupying those spaces, so that's quite sculptural. So it's, 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 a, it's quite a tension that you create. Um, in such, you know, I mean, just as a general observation in, in your work. Yeah. Does it, I mean, does that sort of, you know, when you're talking about Hopper, does that kind of come into your process? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think I'm always drawn to sort of lone figures in quite epic settings or um, and definitely the 
sumptuous colour palettes of Hopper. I'm always looking for the and with the light and the shade and the. Um, but I think it's more probably a subconscious thing with these things all feeds in. I think much like Claire, I've. I'm not used to public speaking and uh, yeah, I'm way outside of my comfort zone. But I think it's a really good practice to, to sort of sit down because I've always felt like I just work very intuitively. So to actually try and put in to articulate why I do what I do and what I'm looking for is, is quite yeah, helpful, I suppose. So, so faces. You've done. I mean, they are crystal sharp, so clear. You've really just captured something, especially things with reflections and things like that. But some other ones, I'm just going bloody hell. In the middle of that, I just I would swear it's a painting, you know, and, and, a, and a really big painterly painting, you know, uh, which is more like the hopper stuff. And you yeah. just go on the bottom half of something, and you go, oh my god, it just looks like the top half's a photograph and the bottom half's a painting. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's within this selection, because obviously you take more yeah. photographs. Um, again, I think it's something, I guess, I've trained my eyes to look for certain things, but it's not something that I'm really consciously, when I'm out taking a picture, I. Yeah, look. Yeah, will you go back to the thinking one? Because that's really interesting about what you're saying when you're taking portraits. The thinking one, because it's we were all on that shoot that day, and there was a moment when the sun came round and Hugh just knew, and he got this young woman, and you have just think, my God, what's she thinking about? What's she dreaming about? What are her hopes and ambitions? And you just caught that moment for life that this incredible young woman is looking out. <laughs> we don't know what she's looking at. What she's was she waiting for someone? It's just amazing. It's just like a painting that you're just thinking all these things. What there? Yeah. What yeah. is going on through that girl's? And you, you know, you just knew that was the, the one, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Like with Brian as well. I think. Um, I think it takes a little while of being with the person you're taking the portrait of to for them to feel relaxed and for you to... But that's like great portrait, and just makes me want to know that man and what was he thinking? He lived such an extraordinary life, didn't he? And yeah, he did. Oh my God, that just captures him. I just want to know how many photographs you actually took, because if you took like a hundred, it's going to affect the way he poses, isn't it? Hanging around while you're just taking loads of money off, or do you just... Uh, maybe I'll take a few. Yeah, I mean, with that one, I... Because he, he was an old neighbour of mine who um, sadly died a couple of years ago. And he used to go and drink every morning. He'd go and have a brandy and a coffee in the Emporium on uh, London Road that isn't there anymore. Um, and I, I had photographed him before and I said, oh, I'd really love to take your portrait and do it properly. Um, so I went with him that morning and I which I don't usually do, but I did set that one up on the tripods and I, he had his brandy and his coffee. And I probably only maybe took 15 pictures. Um, and yeah, that was, when I looked through them, that's the one that sort of jumped out at me. Um, Is that the important? Yeah. Which I think is close I, I really like the, the series you're doing with the Iranian performance artists. I think that's. Really yeah, I mean, that's only a tiny yeah. little snippet. I mean, with him in the sky, is he literally in the sky? And sort of yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's on a trampoline in a lot of ah, those. Um, right. And yeah, sometimes we shoot it at night and I'm using flash or. Um, but we haven't been, we've been doing more recently, I guess, video of him. Sort of moving in public spaces, and which goes back to my point about sort of that movement in public spaces, which you're kind of animating in a way in those videos. You know, because the space. I mean, as you know, reading food code, spaces um, make us conform to certain behaviours. Yeah, you know, they're very much designed, particularly. 
like the Victorian prisons. They regiment people in a particular way. So it, it's interesting that your collaboration with him is breaking out of those kind of um, behavioral modes. Uh, yeah. All trying to <laughs> probably break out of all that we're all trying to. Yeah, it's funny because I've been with him at uh, Victoria and filming him. And, I mean, a lot of people just don't pay any attention. <laughs> Or just probably walking by thinking, oh, what does that matter? But a lot, a fair few people do stop and they'll watch. And mm -hmm. I think it's great because it does make them, yeah, they just think about how conform, how um, conditioned we are. <laughs> Quite interesting. What was the response of the people at the skate park? I mean, I, you know, he was swimming there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they seem to just not mind really. They, I think, they were fairly stoned. <laughs> Probably thought, wow, that's great. That that's is great. a brilliant piece. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you show your? Do you exhibit your work? Uh, we are planning to do something with that. We were mm -hmm. last year supposed to be. Um, uh, there's a gallery called Edge of Arabia, and we were going to be. Um, doing a tour around the States, this, in this, um, I can't remember where, between, between LA and Texas, I think. Uh, he was going to be doing this in these amazing landscapes, because I think for him going back to the States where he grew up in Boston and he got quite a lot of racial <laughs> abuse for being Iranian and for his family. Um, so I think going back there now under Trump would be quite an interesting mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, is, it is the most segregated uh, city in the US, Boston. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's so very I think the other thing that's interesting yes. about like Darvish as well is that I've seen him like I kind of once went to pick my mother up from the train station. We would coming back, and actually he was just. He was um, he was just dancing on the bus, so it's, it's not something he does on just for the for the camera. So yeah, yeah, that and I've seen him as well, kind of go on his you know magic carpets, electric um, skateboard, yeah. um, Madeira Drive by himself. So he obviously um, just loves to kind of elicit those reactions or just kind of create a moment in space himself, does he, <coughs> is there a difference between him doing that and the stuff that you do with him? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he, I think he does it on a daily basis, <laughs> I'm there or not. Um, but I think he's, yeah, he's very interested in documenting it and turning it into, I guess, a, what I'm trying to get to is, is like in your work itself, in your relationship with him, because your other work, a lot of it is capturing the moment and it's not staged so yeah. much. Whereas this is much more of a collaboration, yeah. but in a way it's staged, but in another way it's his natural performance. Yeah, anyway. I would say it's. It, it feels very unstaged when we do it because we'll go down to the skate park and we might shoot for a few minutes and it just he'll just do his thing sort of whether I'm there or not and I'll film it but it it may not work and then suddenly we'll say okay let's just go over him and try him and then suddenly everything will sort of fall into place and people will walk through at the right time and everything and it will just we'll know that we've captured something and that usually happens within half an hour of us being together and yeah so it does feel that it's open to chant and a bit of synchronicity. You know. I was quite um, interested in the way that people are responding to an exterior environment that isn't part of their lives but they have to interact with it and someone who's making the environment playing with the environment making it his own in some kind of way and then the older lady 
um, in her apartment in Paris, yeah. which is her environment, and maybe she doesn't go out so much. I really like that, um, the difference between all yeah. this, and it sort of shows maybe that um, your curiosity about people. And it sort of feels um, warmer than Edward Hopper somehow, unless stage, it's just you're picking up things about people. It seems to be all to do with people and how they are yeah. existing within their, their spaces or other people's spaces. So I've really enjoyed it. And I just sort of wonder with the, um, say, the older lady, when we be able to, as an audience, spend time with her, like, would it be in a you know, just take time with the photograph that yeah. like you can do. Same when it's reproduced in a magazine or a rather than a quick. Yeah. Well, I. So we, yeah. I mean, I. What I'd love to do at some point is maybe go to Lily, where she used to live, and where she was part of the French Resistance, and put together a little show and have the film play. And yeah. I mean, it'd be great to do something. I hate to say it, but if you watch this video online later, you can stop it and look at the picture. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we said right at the beginning, Hugh, that you, yeah. you, you sit between portrait and street photography and documentary. Yeah. Can you tell a bit about what those spaces are when you sit in those spaces? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. I guess I always find it quite hard to sort of pigeonhole myself as a yeah portrait photographer or documentary um, or street photography. Um, so I guess yeah, when I'm doing any of those, I feel like I'm bringing <coughs> an element of each of them. Um, does anything change when you sit in different spaces like that? Uh, I'm wondering if you have a different eye or a different process, or because there's lots of similarities between all of the projects, but there's something slightly different happening for me. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I really love leaving things up to chance a bit. I suppose I. If I go and I do a portrait shoot, or if I'm doing street photography, I'll wait until I find a location that looks right. And I guess same with portraits. Um, and then I'll maybe sit in that area for a while and wait for something to, interesting to happen. But they all seem like that. portraits, hmm. in a way. They're just shorter portraits or briefer ones or more. It's always seems to me about the people that, that are in your photographs. Yeah, I guess a lot of them I always feel quite um, just trying to find some sort of distance from, I suppose, like um, slightly sort of voyeuristic, so <laughs> away from. It's not cold here, and not, as you said, like the damn top ones are slightly voyeuristic and cold, but yours have a real warmth to them, like you really like these people. Mm. That's the difference. You really mm. like these people, they're interested in them, they're sympathetic with them. It's not at all cold. No. I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that it's kind of selection, though. A lot of them, in particular, like the photography on the street, the, um, the characters inhabiting those spaces are moving away. They're almost like moving out of the space, or they're moving backwards into the space. Even the ones on the phone, they're either looking away, and they're looking into the another space. Yeah. So, in a way, they're not inhabiting it. They're trying to disinhabit. Yeah, the yeah. Space. I think that's what I find really is that you can physically be in a space, but mentally you're in this virtual space in another space. And that, that's what's so interesting about this this image actually, because the 
the actual painted canvas. He's what is looking into wanting to inhabit the real space <laughs> in a way. I'm trying to see what happens with that picture in the top corner there. It's trying to oh, where it is and yeah, it's a guy holding a mask actually, which again I thought was quite an interesting part of that. Um, with a dagger. <clears throat> Can I ask what your approach is to photographing people in public spaces and that's problematic? Yeah. Is it a problem for you? No, because I don't ask them. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I'm not very brave at approaching people and asking for their pictures. And I also think as soon as you ask somebody to take their picture, then it becomes a portrait and it's a stage thing as opposed to actually capturing a moment, which, yeah, is the hard thing, as you know, being a photographer, that you feel a bit like you're stealing something from somebody. You know. <laughs> stealing their soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Both of you for an excellent night. I know you say you would not be comfort zone talking, but both of you have been fantastic and um, given a real insight to your practice. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>